you get kind of like chat and you never know what uh good sound bites you might get when you're just uh having a conversation yeah i like that part about it too is not to make it because i was with the show i was i was putting a bunch of format on it and making it like structured which ended up being kind of nice but i like the just whatever discussion comes naturally kind of way has a nicer flow to it i think in that way yeah i feel like it's good to have um a topic of discussion and maybe a couple bullet points but having yeah. everything scripted makes it a uh, feel more like an interview and less like a discussion yeah i've been getting like weird earplugs for the last couple of weeks like my ears just you know how when you go up or down a, a mountain really fast mm -hmm. your ears plug so that's been happening with my ear particularly oh. this ear my left ear right so this is my left side yeah and it's weird i don't know what is happening because i can make it like that and it goes away for a while but then it'll come back eventually so i don't know what's going on with that body's changing man yeah So we should talk about this millennial thing because you just wrote an article about that. And there was that article from the Wall Street Journal saying how millennials are in such bad shape financially. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. What do you think about that? Millennials, the new scapegoats thing? of America. Right. And what uh, was, number, one, it's quick, is, number one, it's quick bait. It's just yeah. a hot topic. Well, the Z it gets it gets, the, it gets the older people gets the older people on social media to be like, yeah, let me read about those those millennials, <laughs> how bad they're doing. <laughs> but the Gen Zers, I guess, are not old enough to have that kind of content appeal to them yet. Not they're yet. still in high school or college. Yeah, then that's like picking on a little kid. So that's like, millennials soon. are old enough where you can start picking on them. And I guess it'll be like the Gen Xers are the ones oh. who uh, will, will, uh, will pick on the Gen Zs. Um, but what the, I think the bigger problem is, is when you're younger, you're always, every, you're always learning, right? Like when you're a little kid and you see like a movie for the first time, it's like all new. So it's making like new connections in your brain and you're having new experiences rather than like your parent who brings you to a theme park. They've already been there like 20 times, but yet it's the child's first experience there. So like their brain's going crazy. It's making all these new connections in their head. Um, and I think that's what happens with most adults. They stop making new connections and that's what causes them to get uh, stale. Yeah, because you can still learn something even if you've been to the amusement park like a hundred times. If you go with the mindset that you're going there for the first time, then you will learn something. Exactly. Um, so it's about mindset. And I mean, it's the same thing with like when you get drunk for the first time. Like your brain's like, oh, this is awesome. This is awesome. Yeah. And then like, Obviously, there's one of you know. There's a few directions you go. You'd be the person who can control the way you drink. Uh, you're the person who can't control it, and you become dependent on alcohol because you want to have that experience. But over time, our bodies adapt to things, and when our uh -huh. body adapts to things, it's not able to create the same euphoric feeling that something once had. And you you get people who get caught in chasing that feeling rather than looking to a different direction to find a new connection in their mind. So that's a, what do you think is the difference between the person who like, who gets drunk for the first time and then can't control it and becomes an alcoholic versus somebody who takes it as like, wow, that was fun. That's something to do sometimes and is able to do it in moderation. What do you think is the difference between like those people? I think it has to do with personality. Like some people have an addictive personality and I, it, it's probably just the way like they're wired um, rather than some people aren't 
get addicted to things as easily. Um, it just has to do with like the way your brain is set up just because everyone's a little bit different. Like some people are going to get impacted more by alcohol than others. Like some people are going to get drunk off one or two drinks. Whereas other people who might have a family history of alcoholism takes 10 drinks to get the same feeling as someone who doesn't have that sort of family history. So the question being like how some people can control it and others cannot, it just has to do with your, your wiring, which we have no control over. So it's just an inborn trait and that's Yeah. It. Cause I mean, you can get, yeah. I mean, you can get addicted to anything. Like you can get addicted to drinking coffee. You can get addicted to drugs. You can get addicted to money. You can get addicted to success. You can mm-hmm. ad- get addicted to donating your time. Yeah. You can get addicted to exercising. Um, so, I mean, you can get addicted to anything, but it's obviously you want to get, di- you want to get addicted to more good things than bad things. So does everybody have an addictive personality then? Probably. I mean, I'm not like a psychologist or an expert in the brain field, Um, but I'm sure other people get addicted to, you know, certain things easier than other people do and vice versa. Um, I know in the book Atomic Habits by James Clear, he writes how we value the present more than we value the future and that we're still working on caveman brains, even though we're not living in a caveman or cave woman or cave person kind of world. Right. Like our brains have not evolved to keep up with so-called technological advancement. No, we're still working on uh, old infrastructure. We're still uh, in a horse and buggy and uh, when we're living at times where we're going to the moon and Mars and beyond. Well, we're still like learning how to communicate with each other. That's a big thing. Like we still haven't figured that part out. We can do all this other stuff like go to the moon, but we can't communicate and get ideas across from one brain to the other, you know? Well, that's the beauty of why the internet was created was so that scientists from across the world can share their ideas. Um, However, the internet has transformed into something completely different than what it was intended to. Um, However, the problem with communication is there's different ways to communicate. um, But most of the time people only know how to communicate one way. So that's why people who are like leaders of organizations, like CEOs and le- you know, and uh, world leaders, they're master communicators. They can deal with, you know, at all kinds of people to get their message across. Mm-hmm. Like for example, uh, when someone says, "Yeah, I I live right up here on the left." If you're someone who's not a native English speaker, it's very hard for their brain to connect what that means. Arjun, right here on the left, because they think you're saying right and then you're saying left. And when you say, that's why the English language is so hard to understand. Yeah, I've heard it's harder to learn English than it is other languages. Yeah, because it's just so complex. It is a nice language, though, I think. English? Yeah, English is good. I mean, when I, when I went to Spain, people would ask where I was from, and I said, Florida. And they would say, I don't know where that is. And <laughs> if I said I'm from Florida, La Florida, they would know where Florida is, but they didn't know where Florida is. Everybody knows where San Francisco is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> California. Yeah. You don't even have to like, I don't even say the state. I just say the city. And people are like, oh, wow. Golden Gate Bridge. And I'm like, yeah. (laughs) But so I'm curious more about this addictive personality thing because it sounds like you think that everybody has an addictive personality and it just depends on what you're addicted to. So you want to be addicted to like good things so-called good things like working out and eating healthy Mm -hmm. 
and those are your addictions and you're no control over you, but you got to be in some way can in control over what you're addicted to. But are you saying that you can't, you're, you're not in control over being an addict or not? It's just, Everyone's you just have control ad- over, you just have control yeah. over what you're addicted to. Yeah. I mean, everyone's an addict. So Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, or any other addict group, their main focus is to replace your addiction with something else. That's right. Like a support system. Interesting. So like uh, Starbucks, how, how long are the lines in Starbucks? Um, whatever they were before times six. <laughs> exactly. So those people are willing to wait in that long line for a average cup of coffee because uh-huh. they think they need it. <laughs> in some sort of way right or chick-fil-a yeah uh, chick-fil-a is a good example um chick-fila I, chick-fila i always <laughs> see a line at chick-fila i mean it's i mean people love it um yeah. even mcdonald's french fries are engineered to literally dissolve as they hit your mouth right they're so good they're so good mm-hmm. they, they're engineered to literally like get you addicted to it yeah. Um, and I mean, it starts like one but time. They're, like, they're just right, so like, good. They're just like delicious, right? And I right. think there's people at McDonald's whose job it is to make that really delicious. And they've done a good oh, yeah. job because all their food is really delicious. It's yeah. so good. But that goes back to what I was saying. You know, it, what a bad habit is good in the present, but bad in the future. And good habits are bad in the present. They feel bad in the present but they feel good in the future. So the idea is, and with like money, how do you value your, how do you reward yourself in the present? I don't know about that because I just had a really delicious breakfast, Mm -hmm. eggs, hash brown and bacon. And it was so good. It does look good. It was so good. Yeah. That's not a negative thing. Like that's not a future negative. I mean, that was a meal you prepared yourself. I'm talking like eating fast food. So basically like you got to reward yourself for the good habits with some sort of way because bad habits typically feel better than good habits do. Oh, you remind me of the, have you read the book, the power of habit? Hmm. Maybe. It's the uh, yellow book with some red on the cover with a circle. Yeah. His main premise is that his main premise is that, uh, you you need to replace the bad habits with good habits by giving yourself a reward for doing the good habits. And that way you can break yourself out of the cycle that you're stuck in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, was that the book where they talked about the person who uh, couldn't hold a job and they got a job at Starbucks? Mm-hmm. Tony Dungy, the f- football coach. Yeah. 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 Basically replacing bad habits with good habits, but getting yourself on a reward system. So like if you go to the gym, you come home and you cook yourself a delicious breakfast of eggs, bacon, hash browns. (laughs) Yeah. I was thinking as I ate that breakfast today, it was going to taste so good after working out. Just like it tasted so good by itself. Imagine how good it's going to taste after working out it's going to be so amazing yeah so like for (laughs) example i don't uh i don't have cable in my apartment so if i want to want to go watch tv i got to go to the gym and do like cardio on a machine in order to watch tv because uh i don't have cable here so i'm able to otherwise i just sit on that couch back there watch tv All right. So you 
have you ever been addicted to something before? Oh, for sure. Probably addicted to a lot of things. And were you able to overcome that in any way or did you have to replace it with something else? Hmm. Did I have to overcome it or replace it? Mm, replace it. So like, for example, um, I never like took naps or took breaks as a kid. So like I used to overstudy for tests just because like I wanted to do good. So I would like overstudy and I wouldn't absorb as much of material as I would if I would have like chunked it like you're supposed to. Okay. So I've learned over time that, Hey, like you can only study for this amount of time. Then you need to go like take a break and then like come back. So like, for example, um, today after we're done talking, I have another meeting um, for 30 minutes. So I'll probably like go walk outside or do some sort of activity to clear my mind. And then after that, I'll go reward myself. Um, I want to go to the golf course and practice some golf. And then I'll come back and then I have another meeting. So um, what I've been trying, you know, what I've been doing, not trying, what I've been doing is replicating a child's schedule. Like think about how productive you are as a kid. How doesn't have a schedule though? A child? Yeah. You know, wake up, eat breakfast, go to school, come home, play with your friends, eat dinner, go to practice, do homework, go to sleep. Oh, okay. That's one that was created for them though. But Usually it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a schedule in some sort of way. But as an adult, you have the power to create your own schedule. Right. That's the, that's like the coolest part about being an adult. It's like, I can do whatever I want. If I want to go, uh, out to the corner and panhandle with a sign saying, Hey, anything helps. I, no one's stopping me from doing that. That's true. Um, if I want to go to the liquor store and buy alcohol and drink a bottle of alcohol every night, no one's going to stop me from doing it. So that's maybe where the problem comes in with if you have an addiction or an addictive personality, right? Because nothing's stopping you from going there. It's very easy to get. Yeah, I mean, if you go into a, a gas station and say, hey, give me a pack of Marlboro Lights, are they going to say these are bad for you? You shouldn't buy it? <laughs> well, yeah, on the pack they do technically say that. I mean, they do, but I mean, that's not going to stop the person from selling it to you. Right. And it's not going to stop the person from using them. Mm-hmm. No, it isn't. Um, a, a comedian once said you can make the packs of cigarettes have a skull and a crossbone on the face of the package and call them tumors and people will still buy cigarettes. Yeah. I, th I believe it was Dennis Leary that said that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, think, I don't think you have to replace addictions with anything. There's been things that I've been addicted to that I, there's no replacement. Like I haven't replaced them with anything. And actually, I was trying to, like, I was trying to overcome the addiction on my own. Um, and it, nothing worked. Anything that I tried to do didn't work. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I didn't have to replace it with anything because it just kind of fell away on its own. And if you ask me, like, how did you get over that? I can't tell you how. I have no idea how. It's just mind power. You got to have a, got to overcome no, it wasn't In my power. Because that's what I tried to do first. I tried to like record it. I tried to positively reward myself, negatively reward myself. Like one of the things that I would do, right? Like I wanted to wake up before my alarm went off and I wanted to wake up early, you know, before the sun came up. So what I would do is that every time that I woke up to my alarm, I'd have to pay 20 bucks. Uh, like put it in the post office box or give it to some guy on the street. I had to get rid of 20 bucks somehow every time I messed up, right? Like that would be my charge. 
So I did that for a while and eventually I did get into the habit of waking up before my alarm, but that wasn't a sustaining thing. It lasted for a certain amount of time and then it fell away. Um, but now, nowadays I don't use an alarm at all. And there's no, there's no reward. There's no punishment or anything. And sometimes I'll sleep in to like eight o'clock or nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, but that just happens. But most of the time I'll just get up and it's like six, six, six thirty. 30. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you gotta listen to your body. Your body will reset itself. And if you're having to wake up with an alarm, something's probably not right. What's not right if you're waking up with an alarm? You're probably not getting enough sleep or you need mm. to like maybe take a break in the afternoon and get some more sleep. Um, like go to sleep earlier? Well, sometimes people don't have a choice to go to sleep earlier. So you got to schedule maybe micro naps throughout the day. Even if it's for closing your eyes for five, 10 minutes, that five or 10 minutes can really recharge you. I mean, watching the last dance documentary um, about the bulls and the championship run they were showing Michael Jordan they're like I don't know when he sleeps and they would just show him like at practice there'd be times he's just like on the ground just like passed out uh-huh. even Thomas Edison was said never to be a good sleeper but he would sleep like micro sleep like five ten minutes at a time that sounds pretty crazy, but I mean, if it works, then that's great, you know, but I don't think like people will look at that and think, oh, I got to do that. Or I got to take micro sleeps or take nap. Like people watching this might be, oh, I, I got to just not set an alarm, right? And then they go set in a, not set an alarm and then they wake up late the next morning and they miss out on whatever they were trying to do, right? But so I don't think it's like, I don't think it's, you look at somebody else's thing and try and like copy exactly what they do. No, I, you have to know yourself because every person's yeah. body is different. Like maybe some people need eight hours of sleep and other people only need six. Um, I think it just depends on your body and your lifestyle and probably has something to do with your DNA. Obviously I'm not an expert in DNA, but everyone's bodies are wired differently just like we were saying at the beginning here everyone communicates differently mm -hmm. like for me i've never needed a lot of sleep to function i've always woken up early without having to try oh yeah i've gone but i also fall asleep early i've gone on both sides i've been a really late riser and i've also been a really early riser now i'm sort of on the more earlier side of rising mm -hmm. but i wasn't always So I don't know, man. I don't know what the answer is or what the solution is or what the habits are, whether it's habit or addiction, personality or any of that kind of stuff. I don't know. I feel like it's, I feel like it's, you got to get to know yourself as you said. And then from there, everything kind of just stems out from it. I think you can go crazy by trying to copy others and like trying to design and create your own life, so to speak. Like if you want it in a certain way, then you try and go and set it up. It, uh, you could do it for sure, but I don't think that's where you're gonna find the fulfillment. Yeah, I, I, I believe a lot of the, there's a lot of bullshit on social media that's like, oh, like I wake up at 3.57 every day and I work 20 hours a day and I get four hours of sleep and that's why I'm successful. <laughs> as they drive their uh, Lamborghini that they rented with their stimulus check. <laughs> like, but people, but, but kids will see that or young people will see that or people who are desperate will see that and be like, that's what I got to do in order to be successful. Um, but if you're not getting enough rest and focusing on your health, then you're going to just kill yourself and 
you may have a lot of money in the bank, but then you have to use that money for uh, prescription drugs and rehab and surgeries. And then you're just working backwards. So you got to have find that balance. And uh, there's a lot of a lot of fakers out there saying that they're like 25 with like $10 million in the bank or something ridiculous. And it's just uh, not true. I feel like anyone that has to tell you how successful they are isn't successful. Mm. They may be successful, but not as successful as they say they are. Because they have to embellish like a little to, bit. Yeah, like does Richard Branson, Bill Gates, or Warren Buffett have to tell you they're successful? Um, not really, because everybody is always telling them, telling you how successful they are. Exactly. Um, obviously, you know, you or I, we're both in into coaching. We we could go that route and tell people, hey, this is how successful we are. That's why you should work with us. Yeah, but if you're honest about it, I feel like that's okay. Like sharing your successes without, you know, being being honest about it, sharing your successes without lying about it or saying that, I don't know, if you say you have $10 million in the bank and you don't, obviously that's like not the right way. I don't think to be saying that you're successful but yeah i mean just because you have a bunch of money in the bank doesn't make you a successful person right i would say i'm more successful now at 30 than i was at 25 and uh the amount of money I had in the bank at 25 is much larger than I have in the bank now. That's just the way I view it. Yeah. We get, we get rewarded for the more people that we impact their life in a positive way. Mm-hmm. So focusing on doing the most good, as the Salvation Army might say, will get you the reward that you're looking for. Not, hey, I want to buy a Lamborghini Gallardo in a private jet. Yeah, but if you do want to do that stuff, that's fine too. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I would be lying if I said I didn't want to have nice things. However, the only way I'm going to get those nice things is by impacting people's lives in a way where they feel that paying for what I'm offering them is going to give them value, not give me value. So if you, if you do that with the end goal of being that you want to buy nice things and jets, is that, like a thing that you shouldn't do. Yeah, that's that, focusing on is that ingenuine? It's focusing too much on the what and not the why. Like Simon Sinek says people buy why we do something, not what we do. Something along those lines. Do you think you can hide the why? You can but you'll, that'll only take you so far because you'll only be able to uh, create shallow relationships. Mm. It's well, like- You uh, can't really tell people like, what you're doing or why you're really doing it. Obviously, people can be successful in, in, in indus- industries that um, people don't have a choice but to use. Like, for example, if I need to go get heart surgery tomorrow- I don't have much of a choice. Well, I have a choice, not get the surgery and my health suffers or get the surgery and, you know, recover. Does it matter about 
like the experience I have at the hospital or do I have to like, basically, I'm basically just at their mercy. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm going to go out for a nice dinner, I have many choices on where I'm going to spend my hard earned money. And I'm going to go where I feel like I'm going to get the best experience for the amount of value that I'm going to have to give them to get in return. It's the same thing with like attorneys. Like if you need an attorney, do you really have a choice? Like you have to deal with them. You can find it's one, like one of like. those. I mean, suppose you can, um, but it, it's like when you have to have something like you have to have a doctor, you have to have an attorney, you have to, you have things that you have to pay for. Your choices are limited, but when you have the flexibility, like what kind of car do you want to drive? What kind Uh, of uh, clothes do you want to wear? You have choice on how much you are willing to give up to receive. I see. I see what you mean. That's a common thing about like complaint about millennials too. Going back Mm -hmm. to the millennial complaining conversation that we will protest things, but we protest them in a way that makes absolutely no difference to the underlying problem. Like for example, you know how Aunt Jemima, whatever her oh. name is, on the syrup Aunt bottle? Jemima, the, uh, yeah, the maple syrup. Yeah, so they changed the logo because they said the logo was racist. But they didn't change the ingredients. And the ingredients are still like crappy ingredients that you eat a lot of it and it's, it's not good for you. So they changed like the front, but that doesn't change anything really in terms of uh, results. That doesn't get anybody any healthier. Mm -mm. So that's like, okay, we did all this protesting and we got something changed, but the change that was made was completely, it was the stupidest change ever. It's focusing too much on the, uh, the solution and not the problem. It's not even a solution. Like I'll give you another example, right? You know how people are all annoyed about how these big companies, the big evil companies are using child labor uh, from third world countries to make like phones, iPhones and other smartphones. But then everybody still goes out and buys a smartphone. It's like, if you really cared about it that much, then you would vote with your wallet. You would say, no, I don't want to, I'm not going to contribute to this cause and you have to give something up for it yeah well, it's like with climate change everybody wants somebody else to do something about climate change but they're not willing to sell their car or stop driving or move closer to or whatever it is yeah people don't like to be inconvenienced yeah but it's kind of like you don't really believe in the why the true why you know if you're not willing to give it up give up something for it then i don't think that you really believe in the 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 thing that you're saying yeah well people don't like to be different people are afraid to express themselves in a way that they, because with the fear of uh, being rejected. Mm-hmm. I mean, not to get into religion, but isn't that what religion is? It's like different views. You know, people believe this, people believe that. And they reject other beliefs and they have their own beliefs, which is cool. Like believe what you want to believe. Um, but when it comes to like opinions, such as if I write an article, I'll probably get 10 people to read it. Even though I put in all this effort. Yet, at least I'm doing something to make some sort of improvement to society. Which is much harder to do than to go the negative route. Mm-hmm. You know, negativity is very easy to sell. Right. Happiness is uh is not easy to sell. 
takes a lot longer to uh, develop an audience versus if I go on right now and put a social media post about anything that's been going on in the world, you're going to have two sides of the equation, the people that agree and the people that disagree. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to ask you something. I read a post from uh, another financial coach actually posted this on her Instagram. And <laughs> the meme was that it said it was like a black thing with text on it. And the text said, society is splitting in two. It's one side are the people who are driven by fear and who want to be controlled. And then on the other hand are people who are driven by love and want to be free. Something like that. I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but that's the general idea. Society is splitting into people who are fear driven, people who are love driven. And when I saw that, um, obviously anybody who's going to read that is going to say, oh yeah, that's very true. I agree with that. And they're going to say that they're on the side driven by love. Oh, I made a post on this on LinkedIn too. I, I tagged you in it, didn't I? I believe you did. Yeah. So the question is, how do you know that you're on the side driven by love? It's a presumptive question because you're not going to say, oh yeah, I'm a hateful person. And nobody reading that is going to say that. But how do you know then that you're on the side driven by love? Isn't that a good question? How do you know when you're on love? Is it love and hate or love and fear? I think it was love and fear. But love and I mean, love and hate is basically the same thing. Fear comes from hatred. So if I didn't, if I didn't love what I've been doing, such as writing blogs, starting to create videos, reach out to people on LinkedIn, manage money and do financial coaching, I would have quit a long time ago. Okay. It's something I love doing. I love going playing golf, regardless of how bad I play sometimes. Um, I love writing articles and creating valuable content for people to, you know, share my voice and ideas with everyone. Like everyone has access to everything you write, everything I write, every video you post, every video I post. Um, yet right now, the amount of people seeing them is very small because uh, nobody wants to be first to the party. However, if someone like Oprah had Arjun on uh, her show, everyone would start to follow you regardless of what, whether they agreed or disagreed with you. They would be like, oh, Oprah? Likes that guy? I love that guy. Oh yeah. I haven't read I haven't read one thing he has said. I haven't read one thing that he has posted. I can't even pronounce his first or last name, but he is my guy. And they they would like me because Oprah likes me. Yeah. So are Oprah they likes driven, you. You gotta be like you gotta be likable. Are those people then driven by fear or are they driven by love? Those people are more on the fear side because hmm. they have to wait for someone to be endorsed before they will follow someone. Interesting point. That's true. That is very true though. That's, that's, that's so true. Like for example, like um, uh, what's something that's like super popular nowadays that like a lot of people are doing wearing masks means wearing masks. <laughs> Like making it like a fashion statement. Like it's, I mean, obviously people need to wear masks and it's for the safety of others is the idea. Like it's not protecting me from me. It's me protecting myself from what I'm breathing out on other people that may be high risk to some sort of illness. Yeah. You don't want to kill your grandma. That's how they're selling it. Yeah. <laughs> 
but that's fear, right? That's selling fear. Oh, this right. can kill you. You need yeah. to wear a mask. Are, 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 um, when you buy a new car, are they selling, Hey, this thing can kill you. Um, the finance manager does. <laughs> At that point, you're already p committed to the process. Right. That's when you need to buy all the protections and stuff. Hey, you want to come fly in our airline? We could, we could crash. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible. I mean, it's, I mean, it's the same thing with, uh, <laughs> A lot, I mean, a lot of things, uh, they sell either the fear, the fear side or the, uh, yeah. the status side. Like for example, uh, I was talking to someone earlier about, uh, the Microsoft Zune. The what? The Zune, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I Microsoft. <laughs> I mean, so a lot of people aren't going to know the Zune, but the Zune was way better than the iPod. However, when it marketing is extremely powerful. So the way they marketed the iPod was a thousand songs in your pocket. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I don't know how the Zoom was marketed, but obviously it wasn't marketed in a way that was as effective. Um, people buy an MP3 player buy, play songs on demand. Yeah. Really I mean, do people, do like people buy phones phone. because it's the best phone or do they buy the phone because that's what everyone has? Yeah. So, so how do you know, like, so you're on the side driven by love, right? I, I hope so. That's the route I'm taking. And I find myself alone many, many times. So, I mean, I feel like if I'm doing something different, then that's a good sign because I don't want to do as well as everyone else. I want to be in a class of my own. Mm. And you can't be in a class of your own if you do the same thing as everyone else. Okay. Unless everybody else is on the side driven by love. Yeah, but that's, <laughs> you'd be lying to yourself if that's the case. Yeah, that's an interesting. I mean, that's, that's all. That's that's how politics are ran. Is all on fear and hate, and divide and you know, pulling people away from each other. Right. Rather than asking, "Hey, man, these are your beliefs. Why are these your beliefs?" And sitting there and listening, and not saying anything. Like you don't have to agree with someone, but at least take the time to understand why they view what they view. And if you don't agree with somebody, can you tell them that they're dumb? You can, but <laughs> who likes being told they're dumb? Uh, not many people, I guess. Yeah, I mean, in sales, they say you can build a bridge or you can build a wall. So you, I mean, you have a choice. You build a wall, maybe a pretend wall or an actual wall, which was a big debate at one point in time about four years ago. Uh -huh. Literally had people chanting, build a wall, or you can build a bridge and work together. Um, however, having the two sides of the equation, they balance each other out. You got to have a checks and balances with everything. You got to have the person that's like, all right, let's go skydiving. You know, I'm ready to jump out of this plane. Someone who's fearless, but you also have to have someone who's like willing to pull you back too to make sure that you're not jumping out of the airplane and be like, hey, Josh, you don't have your parachute on. Make sure you have your parachute on. So having those checks and balances because People fear what they don't understand and what they don't understand, they either weren't taught in school, which isn't their fault, or they didn't take the time to get educated on certain subjects such as a uh, recession. Like I'll talk to someone, they go, yeah, the stock market crashed in March. I don't, I don't correct them because I know that they're using terminology that is what they know and what they've been taught. But back in March of 2020 was not a crash. That was a correction. Mm. 
What is a crash? The depression of the twenties would be a crash. Like what? What characteristics does a crash have that a? Because I've been saying crash. I've been calling it the COVID so crash. So crash would be depression level. It's like a category five hurricane, like Katrina or Hurricane Andrew. Like that's a crash. Like it's going to take years and years to rebuild. Oh, I see. So a correction is more like because we're back up to now almost all time highs. So that's a that's mm -hmm. more of a correction. Technically speaking. Yeah, so a crash would be like a natural disaster. Mm. A correction would be if we're talking in terms of weather would be like an earthquake. Maybe a couple buildings are affected. Obviously, those businesses are going to suffer for a period of time. But the whole ecosystem or the whole economy isn't going to be hurting for a long, long time. So right now, the United States is in a recession. Um, however, like... I'm not going hungry right now. I can still go out and buy food. Yeah. Um, I'm still able to drive my car. People are still working. But a whole depression would be like bread. Bread turns into like a thousand dollars a loaf. Hmm. Which is what happened after World War II, the Germany. After the war, they went into a depression. And yeah. that's what caused them to get into the war in the first place was the first world war they lost and went into a depression. So they were fearful and people were hungry and they wanted something to believe in. And obviously people didn't know at the time, but they ended up believing in the wrong person to guide them. And that's what happens when people are hungry and fearful and angry. You know, we start following the hate, not the love. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I've been asking that question to a lot of people and I've been getting some very interesting responses. Nobody has said so far that they have been a, uh, that that my presumption is wrong, that you presumed I was on the loving side. I'm actually on the hateful side. Nobody said that so far. No, no one wants to. Some people no have wants to say that they're. Question, and they said if, so, it's not if the someone real says, uh, hey, like I'm evil, like who's going to. No one's going to follow that. Well, what do you mean follow it? I mean, who do people like? I mean, do people like Superman or do they like? Oh, I see. Oh, the people are not going to like listen to you if you say that you're evil. You know, you know, it's the hero. Like people want to, people love the hero. Obviously the hero has to have a common enemy, but you know, very few people are wearing, um, I don't know, like, I don't know many villains but like yeah. i see more batman shirts than i see penguin shirts <laughs> or i see more um wolverine shirts than magneto shirts you know i see more mickey mouse shirts than uh um you know oscar the grout shirts and if you start to think about it like kids are taught like you got even from like Sesame Street, you got like the happy characters and you got like Oscar the Grouch that lives in a trash can. Think about what that represents. If you're a grouch, you're going to live in a trash can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rather than like the happiest people, like people like doing business with people who are happy and make them feel good. Not people that make them feel like shit.
Yeah, that's a true statement. Can't argue with that one. Mm -hmm. So, those are my thoughts. Perhaps I'm wrong. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are doing things different than I am who would consider themselves more successful, but they're just measuring themselves in terms of dollars, not in terms of accomplishments or doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Well, they're comparing. I mean, it's the same thing when people compare themselves to other people that are more successful. They say, oh, I'm not as successful because they have more of this or that. If you do it the other way, it's really the same thing. Comparing yourself to somebody who's like lesser successful and you say, oh, I'm better than they are. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Just well, it comes, to mindset. it comes to mindset. Like when you don't start buying things and like you're just living in like an apartment with three or four people, you're splitting the rent three or four ways, you're splitting electricity three or four ways, you're splitting internet three or four ways, you're able to save a lot more money because you're taking on a smaller amount of the risk because you're diversifying your expenses and you're getting other people to support you. Yeah. Whereas when you start a family, you are now responsible for everything, maybe one or two incomes. And so it gets people to be fearful. Like I can't leave. I have a family support. I got kids to feed. I'm not, I can't take that risk. It's like using it as an excuse that they, they can't do things. Uh, Yeah, I see. Yeah. I shared the story with you about that guy who came to me on my last day or last week at work or something. And said that he couldn't do a bunch of stuff because he had that that issue exactly what you described. How much how much money do you think he had saved up in his retirement? I have no idea. Not enough, according to him. Is it ever enough? Um, no. There's your answer. Depends on what you define as enough, though. I guess, but yeah. Well, most successful businesses are started with a thousand dollars or less. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was actually, I'm going to write an article about that. What retirement taught me about money. And one of those things is that there, the idea of enough money is an illusion. There's an unlimited supply of money. Yeah. The government just showed that, that they'll just print some and hand it out to everyone. Yep. And I mean, at the end of the day, we get charged for it. So it's really a good system. It's really amazing. It works really well for the purpose that it was designed to What people fail to to realize is... um, in 2008, where the government made a mistake is they gave the money to the big banks. Yeah. And they told the banks to lend out the money. But that wasn't a mistake. They did that on purpose. But then the banks didn't lend the money. They're like, we're giving you this money so that you can lend it out. So what the government did was, is like, all right, this didn't, the banks didn't lend out the money. So we're going to just lend the money directly to the public. Mm-hmm. Um, And that's why the stock market has recovered so quickly is because people were able to gain access to money that did not exist before. So they've been able to maybe tread water during these times. Mm. Whereas before, if I have to go to my bank to get money, um, it's a, it's a much slower process and the bank is going to look after themselves more than they're going to look after your business. So the bank was supposed to lend out the money to individuals. And businesses. For free? Uh, I mean, not for free. But that was the idea. The They gave them money to lend out. Like, you will lend out this money. And they just, a lot, a lot of them, I believe, just held it. 
for oh. themselves. And that was the, um, and that's what caused the great depression of the twenties. Um, what Ben Bernanke, who used to be the fed chair would say is the problem with the depression in the twenties was, is that the small, the smaller businesses couldn't gain any access to capital to keep their businesses rolling. Mm. So they weren't able to borrow money in order to keep their money, you know, keep their, keep their business thriving. And so when they had no access to money and, and you know, demand goes down, um, it's hard to navigate those turbulent waters versus a company like, I don't know, just name any big ones. You can go on finance yahoo.com and look at their balance sheet and how much they have in cash. They can go years without making money and be fine. Whereas someone who is uh, following the dream, they're not at that point. Hmm. Have you ever seen the movie The Aviator? Nope. With I've Leonardo seen Top DiCaprio. Gun. Is it similar Did you to know Top, Top Gun? Gun was you know Top Gun was called one of the most overrated movies of all time? No, I didn't know that either. Get out of here. That's definitely that's 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 a load of crap. That's a great movie. The Aviator or Top Gun? Both of them. But Top Gun oh, was ranked one I of the most the overrated Aviator. movies. So the Aviator was about Howard Hughes. The guy who made the airplane? Mm-hmm. Okay. So the story is he inherited a, uh, a tool bit company in Texas from his family. And that made, that was like his cash flow. Like that company was his money maker. And he used that money to innovate in the aviation sector. And he also made movies. So like he knew he could rely on this money. Like he knew it was going to come. It was going to come. It was going to come like clockwork because it was a very successful business. And there was a point in the movie where he owned an airline and they had to keep all of the planes on the ground for some sort of reason, some sort of regulation or what have you. And so like the, air, the airlines burn in money, burn in money, burn in money. And he goes to his accountant that I want you to get a loan. I want you to borrow against every asset we have. The desks, the chairs, the pens, <laughs> the pencils, every single thing we got. And the accountant goes, what happens if we default on the loan? And then he goes, then, uh, one trip buys us cheap and he's the CEO of their competitive airline. So he was someone who is on the love side. He was willing to risk everything that he owned for his airline to make it, make sure that they're able to keep the dream alive. Whereas the fearful side would have came in and said, eh, too bad. I'm out. I'm going to cut my losses. Okay. Um, it's not really related to that, but one of the things that you brought up is an interesting point. Um, he had a business that was able to cash flow him like whatever he needed, right? Mm-hmm. So there's this idea, like, because that's what everybody's goal is, right? Is reaching this level of financial freedom where you can just kind of do what you want and not have to worry right. about the money. Wake that up, is, money's just in your bank account. Right. That's sort of the thought behind why universal basic income is a good idea because you can just get that right away and now you can go do what you want. Yeah, did you see the social media posts about uh, the teacher that taught an economics class? Nope. So at the beginning of the class, and if I 
misrepresent this in any way. It's not not on purpose. I just came across it real quick. It was one of those uh, clickbaity kind of posts, but it was interesting. And I guess the class voted for universal uh, universal grade system, okay, or something like that. And so, like, basically, they would just take the average of what everyone gets, and that's what everyone receives. So mm -hmm. like the first test, everyone got a B. Mm -hmm. So like the kids that got A's on the test yeah. were upset. And then the kids yeah. that got F's were happy because yeah. they got B's. And then the kids that got F's were like, oh, like I don't have to study. I got a B. So I'm just going to continue doing this. And then like the next one like was a C. So the kids that got A's were upset. And then the kids that got F's were like, oh, I got a C. Cool. I didn't do anything. And then the moral is at the end of the class, the entire she the teacher failed the entire class and she said, This is <laughs> what <laughs> this is what the this system would do. It's yeah. basically you're taking the people who work hard and you're you know, telling them that their hard work is not rewarded, and then you're rewarding people who do nothing. So most millennials don't seem to get that. Or well, they don't think that people are gonna be lazy and bring the whole group down most it seems like most people think that i mean it's not even just millennials i mean it's a lot of people that think this too they think that if you just give it to somebody then like they're gonna do something productive with society or contribute in a positive way not most people definitely not most people yeah that's an interesting uh, experiment that the teacher did, huh? I mean, let's, uh, I've seen people Uber less than a mile to work. <laughs> yeah. That Uber costs probably $3 or more. They could have walked there in 20 minutes or less. Right. At an average pace. But where it's so convenient to Uber, I'll just Uber. It's it'll come pick me up. It'll drop me off. Whereas if there was no Uber, you didn't have a car. Either you had to call someone to come pick you up, or you would just have to suck it up and walk, and get a little exercise. So what is how does that relate to the capitalism versus people don't want to work. People don't want to. People just want things to happen for them. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see, I guess. But if you want to call the Uber, it's because you have money to be able to call it. Like UBI is saying that everybody gets to call an Uber and it's free. Who's that? Who's what? Who, who said they get to do an Uber for free? UBI, like the Universal Basic Income people like oh. the little Andrew Yang's the little Bernie Sanders is everybody gets to call an Uber for free. If you want an Uber, you get an Uber. And you don't have to pay for it. Every system's never going to please everyone. It's just like the same thing about a, big companies that offer free shipping people yeah, complain that companies really. like that pay no taxes but why don't you like you said at the <laughs> beginning of our conversation stop using them exactly no no i just can't somebody said that it wasn't their responsibility to like make sure that companies uh operate in a humane way or something but Apparently, um, apparently people uh, have no issue coming together when, uh, you know, when they're feeling hurt. Yet when it comes to like being the one person to stand up, people aren't willing to do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's like you don't, if that is the case, you don't really believe in the underlying thing.
Like I'd say that's true. Let's take hot, contentious climate change, for example. I don't think people believe in that, even though they say that, oh, I believe in it and we need to stop money and I'm willing to pay taxes more for it. But when it comes to like the everyday decisions that they make, it's like buying a house right next to the ocean. And they think, oh, the water level, they, they, you know, they go and there's some politicians that have done this. They go out and campaign about how we need to save the world from climate change and sea level rises. And then they go buy a big house next to the ocean. So they don't really believe that. Yeah, as they say, the bigger the lie, the easier it is the belief. Yeah, a Nazi not guy said that. No cli- I'm, not, I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying there's no climate change. Um, I'm not a scientist. It's not my area of expertise. <laughs> I'm just saying that you know, the bigger the lie, the easier it is to believe. Yeah. You don't want to be the one to stand up and say that it's not, not real? Climate change? <laughs> or just anything? Yeah. I mean, I talk about things all the time on the investing world that people do that aren't in their best interest, but everyone else is doing it. And who, why would I believe, you know, my word over a big company's word? Yeah. Cause there's safety in the big company. Safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell that to all the people that got cut from their jobs immediately, if not sooner after this whole stuff happened. How safe that job is. Because the thing with, so to argue the one side is when your company is publicly traded, you have to protect the shareholders because those are the people who own the company. Right. So in order to protect the shareholders, sometimes they got to make cut costs. And when what's, one of the easiest way to cut costs is to cut out jobs, salaries. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, it's probably not the best thing to do every point of the time. It's just an easy solution. But the thing that is, um, that I, I kind of get, but it's also like, I don't understand it. Whenever you get employed by somebody, you sign a contract of employment. And in that contract, I mean, you agree to it clearly because you sign it, that your, your job may be terminated at any point in time, either by you or the company. For any reason. So very, in, so very interesting th- thought that went in there. So like, let's just say you and I, Arjun, we work at the same company. We're both salaried employees. Yeah. We make the same amount of money. Does it matter who works better? To who? Either of us. Does it matter who works better? Yeah, like let's just say I'm a slacker and you're an all-star. We're both salaried, getting the same amount of money. Is your pay gonna be any different than mine? No, if it's the same exact pay structure, then no, it's gonna be the same. Exactly. So isn't but, that kind of like a form of like universal income within companies though? No, because there are going to be opportunities that I get that you're not going to get because I'm working harder, better. I'm Maybe. providing more results. That's, a, that's assuming they promote you. But I'm saying like the, for that present I'm also time, going to be luckier. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe for that very point in time. Maybe, no, I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe, maybe, but maybe I'm slacking on this job. Yeah. Doing the bare minimum, you know, doing good enough. So I'm not on the naughty list, yeah. not doing so great where, you know, I'm winning awards, but I'm taking that guaranteed income to fund a passion of mine. Yeah. It's fine. So I don't know. There's nothing, about, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? No, but Whew. that's like you said. It's a very you're focused on the now. That's a that's like a present focus thing, 
where we care about yep. the instant gratification. Whereas there's this other saying that's coming to mind. It's that do the job, do the job that you want well before you have the title and the pay. So my yeah. mindset in working has always been that I'm going to come in with a specific, like people are going to hire me for a reason, but I'm not going to just like stick to that. And if somebody says, Hey, come do this or Hey, do you want to help with this? And I'm going to be, if I have the bandwidth to do it, I'll be like, yeah, I'll help with it. Sure. Like, uh, I don't, I'm not going to say, Oh, that's not my job or, you know, yeah. turn it down. Right. Even though in that very instant, when I accept that thing, I'm not getting, I'm not getting paid commensurate with somebody. If they had hired for that role that, you know, they, they would have probably paid that person a little bit more. Right. Yeah. So good point. So the love going back to love and hate. So like Arjun, do you mind doing this for me? No, Josh. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that for you. Well, first I'll ask, what is it? <laughs> I got to know what it is to first. Do it. Okay. Hey, let's just say it's something that you, you agree to do. So I go to Arj and say, Arjun, you're really good at this. You mind helping me out? I'm just swamped today. Yeah, man, mm. I'll do it. I'll help you out. Sure. Versus I go to Arjun and say, hey, man, can you help me out with this? And you go, I don't get paid for that. Yeah. <laughs> So I would say that's like the difference is like, I'm not getting paid for it today, but if you help me out today, then you can come to me later. Maybe I need to help you out. Be like, Hey Josh, do you mind helping me with this? Mm -hmm. And I had this happen in real life. I asked someone to do something for me and they said they don't feel comfortable doing it because they don't know me or my company. And yeah. so I said to them, do you recall when we went out to dinner and I helped you with this, this, and this? Oh, were you dating this person? And they go, person? oh my God. And Am I what? Were you dating this person? <laughs> no, this is like someone who asked for my help with something. Sounds like, some, not sounds only like did something I, my girlfriend would say if I had one. <laughs> no, like... Not only did I help them, I bought their dinner for them too because they were going through tough times. Wow. And so they told me no. Like when I asked, this is several years later, but I remember, so I had to bring it up and go, hey, do you remember that time you know, at this restaurant that we went over this, this, and this? And the response that I got was, oh my gosh, I completely forgot about that. Yeah, I'll do that for you. <laughs> Amazing. So, and that goes back to building the bridge or building the wall. So I could have built a bridge there and said, you what do you mean you won't a, help me? You built a wrecking ball. <laughs> I didn't build a wrecking wall. Yeah. They put <laughs> up she a wall. Like threw up, she, threw up, she threw up the wall. She's like, no, like I, don't, like, I don't feel comfortable doing this for you. Yeah. Like, and then I could have <laughs> said, I could have gone the hateful route and said, what do you mean you won't help me? Like, remember that time I helped you? Now you won't help me? Like, what what kind of person are you? Isn't that what you did? Rather than just, no, I didn't say it that way though. Oh, you said, said it in a, it different in a very way. nice tone. I said, <laughs> I said, hey, like, hey, like, I understand why you feel that way. However, I I felt comfortable asking for your help because if you remember when we went to that restaurant a few years ago, I helped you with a few things. So so that's the reason why I felt comfortable asking you for this. Oh, I see. That's a very different phrasing than what you first said. Well, I didn't go into the details as well as I did the second time. Because her objection was, I don't know you and your company, right? So you reminded mm -hmm. her that, well, you actually, you do know me and my company. Remember this? Yeah. 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 You weren't so like... You what I was had in my mind was you told her, what do you mean? Don't you remember when I did this thing for you and we sat in this restaurant and all that stuff? And then she was like doing it out of guilt or something, but that's not what happened, huh? No. So there's a, there's like parasit, like parasites, like people who are parasites who the only reason they call you is when they want something. 
So yep. what's in it for them versus what's in it for you. So you got to make sure that you have those relationships where it's like, all right, I help this person out. I have earned the, the right to ask them to do this for me. It's not like they're doing me a favor. It's bringing the world into a balance. Like I did a good deed for them. Now they need to, you know, help me out in my time of need. Interesting, man. It's not looking for, I'm not looking for any more or less than I provide them. I'm just asking for something in return. So wouldn't that mean that you do, you give things and you do things for other people because you then later expect them to give you something? No, that's the, that's the point of a gift. Like you give, you give a gift and don't expect anything in return. Right. When someone needs help, like you offer a helping hand, but if there comes a time where you really need help, and they asked for you for help in their time of need, I feel like you, you know, that's the gift they can give to you. What if you're the first person to ask for help to somebody? You've never well had at that point you're the giver. Before, right. Yeah. Well, at that point you're either the giver or the taker. And then it's going to take another act to bring the the relationship into balance or the person who is constantly taking is take, 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 take. And then you got the person who is on the other side, who's giving, giving, giving and not receiving anything in return. How do you keep track of all that? I mean, you can't, that's just the way the world works. You've got the takers and you got the givers. And if you give as much as you take and take as much as you give, you'll be in balance with people and the universe. If you're into that sort of thing. Then there's got to be more givers than there are. Because if, <laughs> if there's a person who's only a taker, then to balance it out, there has to be a person that's only a giver. Right. Who's read the book and everything. However, you got to realize when people are becoming only takers and you got to cut those people off. You got to cut off their oxygen supply. Right. So they'll have to go find a new giver. Oh, so they just move from giver to giver. Of course. And then eventually when... And then they die. Yeah. (laughs) And the last thing they take... The last thing they take is their own life. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, that was a very dark joke, but I feel like a lot of people who do that feel like they're givers. They give so much and the world just takes from them. Everything that they have. Ah, man, mm-hmm. I don't think there's like a equation to this whole thing. I really don't. I think it's more like a natural law, the way that you said, right? It kind of balances out on its own. Like if you're a taker and you just go and take from people, you never give back, then people are not going to want to work with you, do business with you, be your friend. Because they'll know eventually, like it'll come yeah. to light that they only you're a parasite. This is my final thought and I got to get running. It's kind of like the kids that cheat in high school to get good grades. And then you go to your 10 year reunion and you see what kind of job they're doing. Like a really good job. Um, and you know that, oh, the only reason you got that is because you cheated t- in high school. No, typically, typically no, because it catches up with them. Uh. You know, a series of bad behaviors can compound into a big problem. Huh. Okay. Well, my 10 year reunion for high school, sh- it should be this year. Yeah. It's supposed to be this year. So I'll let you know if that's true. So he, maybe so it'll take you know 20 years. Like, <laughs> maybe maybe it depends on the person but everything catches up um yeah that so, is I mean, true. You, see, that is true. If you see someone who like cheated in school like they got good grades went to a good college um eventually they're gonna find themselves in a world that they don't understand because they didn't put in the work to understand that world mm. or and themselves people will be like, How they do don't you not- understand themselves exactly yeah amazing all right you got to go right yeah, I got to I got to run. Yeah, take take a walk. I don't know how much time we allotted for today, but uh we're over by half an hour. It's okay. It was for the common good. 
<laughs> yeah, we gave an extra love. half an hour. <laughs> love, not hate. Yeah. So think about that more because that's such a good question. Isn't it a good question? <laughs> yes. A famous uh, philosopher by the name of, uh, I believe, Hathaway asked us all the question, what is love? <laughs> baby don't hurt me oh man don't what, hurt me what a rick roll no more <laughs> what is love <laughs> dun, 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 dun. i mean what is love no how do you know you're on the side of love is the question <laughs> i don't know yeah <laughs> all right buddy you just gotta believe that you are and do the right thing. Yeah, I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's enough to believe. As they say about Santa Claus, believing is seeing and seeing is believing. Yeah. <laughs> Until guess, you turn about eight, then you I find guess, out Santa Claus isn't that. real. Right, but you have been seeing him all your life. <laughs> of course. All right, bro. All right. I'm out. Uh, we'll, we'll schedule our next one um, and figure it all out. Okay. Sounds good. I'm going to go read your email now. All right. You do that. Okay. Bye-bye. Boy, boy. Bye-bye. <laughs>